If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, oh boy, we had the human garage here at Mind Pump headquarters. We went down to visit them. When did we go down to visit those guys? It was about a month and a half ago, and they've come uh, uh, highly recommended by several several of our fitness buddies and gurus that we have a lot of respect for, and they kept telling us, you got to go down and see these guys at Human Garage. You got to go see these guys at Human Garage. Finally, we were down in LA for something else. And we said, hey, let's look up the Human Garage guys and let's get in contact. And that was when we all went down there and they did work on me first. And we were all really impressed. We were impressed with uh, a lot of the stuff that they were doing. Uh, they love, have a different approach. They do. They have a very holistic type of approach towards chronic pain. I mean, it's almost like it's combining diff- so many different modalities on working on <clears throat> the entire human organism. Very, very smart people. Again, highly, highly recommended to us. And the people that they treat, uh, I mean, everything from professional athletes to celebrities, uh, many of which we can't name, but these the, the people think very highly of these guys. And they come up here, we recorded an episode with them, and then they worked on Justin, which was hilarious. That was a lot of fun because they did some like work inside his mouth to change his posture. And I mean, we talk about it in this episode because some of the stuff... You, you, we're not familiar with. It's very, very different. Uh, if you don't know what's going on, it seems like a bunch of parlor tricks. Mm-hmm. Like if you don't understand what the, what they're doing on a neurological, physical level uh, to the body by by hitting these certain points, it looks like a bunch of parlor yeah. tricks. It's interesting stuff. It's probably the evolution of health uh, when it comes to treating you know posture and pain. Uh, I think this is where a lot of people are going to have to go, um, and their success rate's very high. If you look at their clients and some of the reviews and stuff, it's pretty phenomenal. We have a great conversation uh, with Gary, and I hope I'm saying his last name right, Lineham. Uh He's uh, the founder, uh, very smart guy, very interesting story, which you're going to hear in this episode. Now, you can find their website at humangarage.net. Uh, that's online. Their main location is in uh, L.A., um, and I think they have like a wait list uh, that's uh, really, really long. They do. Uh, yeah, because people from all over are checking these guys out. But anyway, without any further ado, here we are talking to Gary from The Human Garage. My final transition to oh, my cool. own alignment is I've gone all, all uh, taken all lift out of my feet and all natural feet. And that, as soon as I did that, threw my body into a bit of a shock. It's something you got to transition into because your body doesn't get proper feedback. My shoes mm. were actually compensating as I walked. Yeah. So, did you go through a transition phase or did you just go straight into... Transition phase. You went for, from, from six-inch heels to down to three-inch heels right. to yeah. and, uh, regular sneakers and then now these things. So it's funny because we, uh, we work with Nike and the corporate and um, <clears throat> they are uh, bringing over all the shoes. And I put them on within within 30, 40 minutes. My neck is starting to get tight. Is it really? You yeah. know, a lot of people, when they uh, when the whole barefoot thing started, you know, barefoot training, barefoot running, yeah. people would, I had clients who were runners, and they'd be like, oh, this is great, dude, you got to read this book. Like, running barefoot is the way to train. That's like natural. Yeah. And then, you know, a, a week later, they come back and yeah. they're like, oh, they, I, they go from like moon shoes to like nothing. Yeah. You know? And I'm All like, you sudden. can't, you can't just jump like that. Your suit, your feet are so de- deconditioned. Our feet are completely, actually, most adults have pretty much permanently disfigured feet. Uh, and yes. you can, you can correct a lot of it, but you're not going to be able to go back to where, where <clears throat> we, we should be at. What were those pictures you showed me of like so the, some of the tribes? The problem, the, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, he's, uh, I showed him. Some. Oh no, you just you just interrupt when you feel like it. Yeah, That's how this yeah, shit yeah, works. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you won't get fucking. In. You'll in. sit here for an hour and not get a word in with these motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah, so when yeah, you want to say something, you just so, right in there. So we we think of this. Like I was saying, no. no. We, <laughs> go ahead, man. Go ahead. Sorry. We yeah. we think of the problem being at our feet, but really we generate all momentum for our hip from our hips and our feet land. So we run with our hips and our feet land, and so the dysfunction's really at the hips. And if we correct that first, then the feet have a chance. If you haven't corrected the dysfunction at the hips, then you have no chance. And by going barefoot, you'll get beat up. And that's what even for me in this transition, because I was working with Dr. Luke as I switched, I had to keep being adjusting uh, for the first uh, two weeks. I had to keep adjusting all the time because my body kept wanting to go back to the old patterns. 
Yeah, uh, what Justin was talking about earlier is I showed him a picture of uh, some mon- modern hunter gatherer yeah. f- uh, feet, mm-hmm. and they look like like hands almost. Yeah, it's like, like the fingers. toes are all they're spread all out, spread and they're out. like, yeah. yeah, and it looks totally different from. Actually, looks deformed. Very but muscular too. In reality, our feet are all jacked up. Yeah, they're definitely. the ones with the good feet. <laughs> For sure, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. How long? How long did it take you to transition from that? From actually getting to the point where you could handle? Because obviously, you couldn't do that day one. It would make you sore, sore as fuck to walk around with bare feet or shoes that are that minimalist. Well, let's let's be honest. Uh, actually, six months ago, I was sore walking around with with tennis shoes on. Oh wow! So I this whole the whole human garage experiment was just me getting fixed. And, um, and I was the most dysfunctional, functional person you ever met. I look functional, which was worse than being disabled. I mean, if you're disabled, everybody knows you're disabled. If you look functional and you're in pain and you're walking around, everybody's like, what's wrong with you? And so and that transition was, was over years for me. But the final b- bit of it is, as I stopped needing less and less therapy, um, and for me, one of the biggest changes was squatting. I squat four to five hours a day right now. And uh, I squat when I'm on the phone. I squat when I'm eating. I squat, you know, I'll be sitting on the couch. Uh, we were, I was on vacation, <laughs> sitting on the couch on vacation, crashed out, watching, uh, watching some movie. And I was starting to feel tight. And I realized I get up and I realized I want to squat. So I squatted for 15 minutes, got back up on the couch. And I know it sounds weird, but the more that I squat, because you per, we generate momentum from the hips, the more balanced my gait is and the less disruptions I have in the rest of my body. One of the biggest thing, game changers for me was actually starting to apply that right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd seen chiropractors, I've seen fit PTs, and I've always dealt with low back issues, tight IT, hip stuff going on. I've always had this stuff in my ankle pronates. So I've got all these little things that have bothered me. Nothing has alleviated more, more aches and pains in my body than simply doing that 10, 15 times a day all the time. Like, we'll, you'll see us kick our shoes off and then we'll sit up, we'll, per, we'll oh, yeah. perch up on We're here. We're down in the 90 90 position half the time now just to get into That's awesome. Rotation. Just getting comfortable yeah. in that position. That has done more for me than any program that I've followed or exercise routine that I've tried to stay re- just making the habit of getting down in that position. It's funny how much we've lost that. It's such yeah. a fundamental position for humans that we completely lost. Mm-hmm. Yes. There's two things that we were designed to do that we don't do anymore. Uh, squat and walk. We were designed to walk 60,000 steps a day. It's about 12 miles roughly. And Hold on, 60,000? <clears> yeah, 12 miles, hunter-gatherers. So it, oh, so this is based on uh, <clears throat> observations with hunter-gatherers and how many steps they walk every single day. Yeah. I did, I've fun. never heard that number before. Yeah, that's why so I throw out all the time on the show how crazy it is that the, the average American now only steps like four to 5,000 steps a day. Unless you're in LA where we live and it's like less than a thousand. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's giving you some love right there. Well, so yeah. here's something you should know that in Toronto, they have uh, 40% less orthopedic surgeries, um, disruptions, back pains, neck pains, problems that, that they do in LA. And that's the reason why is because they walk three and a half miles a day on average. More than, <clears throat> than LA, people. LA people. Yeah. Mm. And, um, and then we we have the other yeah you have the the flip side of that phenomena the ones who are actually squatting and I noticed you guys said you take off your shoes when you're squatting it's super important because I've been squatting for for years but specifically over the last six months four to five hours a day every day and when I went to the minimalist shoes and uh, the ones I'm wearing are the Vivo barefoot these are awesome and I've got the whole line now and I got rid of every other shoe that I own. Um, I started squatting in these and I hadn't been squatting in barefoot because I was always working. I work six days a week, 12, 13 hours a day. <clears throat> and um, I started squatting and I noticed that the soleus was super tight for about three days. And that means that final little bit, the soleus relates to our traps. So when you have tight traps, you always go down the soleus and you'll find it to be tight. And by releasing the soleus, then the traps start to release. They're just both ends of the spectrum, right? How do you, how do you establish how muscles are connected <clears throat> like that? Like you just said something that yeah. you know most people have never heard before. They never put that together. Well, yeah. How do you how that, do you establish? Is that? that because you're unpacking it and saying, okay, if their traps are bothering, then they're probably got an elevated shoulder this way, so then they have an asymmetrical shift over to your <clears> left, <throat> and so then more than likely this is going to be tight. Is that well, the, the so, theory behind that? Well, let's actually let's talk about the theory of the human body. It's three thousand years old. 3,500 years old, uh, what we know about the human body was taught to us by the Greeks. And <clears throat> what they did 3,000 years ago is they told us about how all the muscles work, they named them, how the organs, and we've never challenged the theory. And the way science works is we have a theory and then we stack facts upon the theory. And then the theory changes and the facts change. So let's just stop calling them facts. Let's call them assumptions until they are facts. 
So the theory, working theory of the human body has never been challenged in 3,500 years. And there's a difference between science and medicine, about 20 years. And, um, you know, for us, we're fully integrated. And what fully integrated means is that we have uh, two MDs, we have uh, two chiropractors, we have um, our own physical therapy, which is, uh, which is neurologically based. We have um, our own style of fascial flow, which is like a massage. We, we have nutritionists. We have everything in-house, but it's not like integrated that you see normally. We all work under the same philosophy. It's the same belief structure, mm. which has been the hardest thing to do, by the way. So when, we come, when I say these things like these patterns, one of the things that was never thought about when we analyzed the human body was gravity and atmospheric pressure. At sea level, and this is a scientific fact, you can Google it if you want, there's 2,000 pounds of pressure on the human body. 14.7 pounds per square inch. So that 2,000 pounds of pressure is sitting on the human body and it's, 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 it's causing um, a movement of pressure around. We have a 2,000 pounds inside that's, that's trying to adapt to the outside pressure. And for me, I haven't, been, I haven't really been anywhere in the last couple of years I've been working. So I was traveling on planes uh, the last, uh, last couple of weeks here. And I started to notice something I'd never noticed before, how pressure was dysregulated. Now, interesting thing about squatting, squatting is the only thing that relieves pressure from the core of the body up through the diaphragm. And dysregulated pressure is what's causing all the issues into the GI tract. Like we have 10 organs, seven of them are, three of them are muscles, the heart, the stomach, and the bladder. So how do the other seven work? <laughs> By the way, the dumbfounded looks I get this even from all, we have about 20% of our clients are medical doctors, uh, physical therapists, chiropractors. And when I ask them this question, it's a completely blank stare almost every time. So one of the comments will come up, it'll be circulatory pressure, the circulatory system. And I say, okay, so what is that? That's blood pressure. So pressure going into an organ affects the organ. What about pressure ambient or around the organ? So when we, when we digest food, all the blood rushes into the greater omentum, which is, sits right on top of the, the small intestines, and that's blood pressure rushing in. And that blood pressure, <clears throat> then the food exchanges with the blood, and it goes, and it's supposed to move its way back out. But pressure gets dysregulated there because we don't squat. So one of the biggest things, and why you've been noticing such a huge game changer, is squatting, we're designed, it helps the body regulate its internal pressure balance. Mm. And if you get too much pressure on these organs, like the liver, the kidneys, uh, the GI tract, um, especially the GI tract, the intestines, it's just like sausage casing and stuff moving through there. And if you put pressure on it, it, it reduces its inability. And then what we're starting to see right now is about 50% of our clients are coming in on the precipice of an autoimmune condition, or they have an autoimmune disease, which really is, is a lot of times misdiagnosed, and it's a backup of a bacteria in the small intestine, SIBO and all those other disease processes, which are really just caused by dysregulated pressure because mm. we don't do what we're supposed to do. We see something very similar to what you're talking about when we have astronauts who come from you know, being out in the space station for you know, months at a time. In fact, there was a... I don't know his name, uh, an astronaut who just came back and he was the longest person ever to live in zero gravity. Mm -hmm. And the health issues that he experienced uh, when he came back, astounding, like Major. fevers, yeah. uh, the chills, depression, anxiety, um, his obviously bone mass, muscle mass decreased, hormones changed. One year rehab and clinically depressed to this point, that same guy. And that's why I keep saying... If we're going to get to Mars, it has, it's not going to be, it's, it's not uh, technology's limitation. It's how do we get people to walk once they're there? Like, mm. we're connected to this planet, whether we like it it's or gonna not. It's going to be our clone selves that live yeah. there anyway. Let's <laughs> just send robots. Let's be what honest, it doing? doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. It's going to be it's gonna be our conscious and some other meat wagon that can handle all that mm. shit anyways, right? Yeah, we're going to engineer yeah, that. Maybe, but yeah, I mean, our, it's, I mean, it makes sense. Our, the, the human body evolved under these, you know, circumstances and conditions. And like I said earlier, squatting, is a fundamental um, movement for humans. I mean, it's babies squat before they can walk. Yeah. In fact, um, you know, if you go to third world countries, this is how people relax and chill. They so go to the squat. bathroom. This yeah. is how women probably gave birth. Obviously, how we pooped. Actually, uh, it's how we. It's how women are told to give birth today in water. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Asia, I grew. I spent my my career uh, traveling to Asia and Europe. And <clears throat> in Asia, it, it, I used to just kind of humorously laugh at everybody squatting. I remember being in Tianjin, it's an industrial city, and uh, there's a train station, there must be 10,000 people there. They have benches everywhere and 5,000 people were squatting. And I took a picture of it. Wow, thinking, really? Yeah, that many a, people oh, were actually great. down in that position? Yeah, and the guys, you know, playing dice and 
<laughs> smoking cigarettes. They relax. Yeah. They relax in that position. So you said earlier that the <clears throat> the theory of the human body or whatnot is 3,000 years old mm-hmm. and is wrong. What what was it 3,000 years ago or what is it now that's wrong well, let's that's just, based on that? Let's just start at some basics, okay? There's mm-hmm. a difference between science and medicine. We've already talked about that a little bit. And it basically, um, there's some simple things. Like if the brain is in charge, then why does the heart beat in a fetus before the brain is developed? Um, if the brain's in charge, the brain's job is to evaluate the internal and external environment and adapt us to that environment. So it's constantly evaluating and adapting. That doesn't sound like a commander, if you, if you see what I'm saying. The body is a computer. The brain is a CPU. It runs programs. And the body's got constantly giving input back to the brain. I think when, Adam, when we were working on you, didn't I do something on your nostril with scent? Yeah, yeah. And it changed your gait. Right. <clears throat> this after you had your fingers in his mouth? <coughs> yes. Yeah. And his yeah. butt. No, <laughs> that didn't no he didn't do that part. No, didn't happen. <laughs> that did not happen. happen. No. <laughs> he charges extra for that. <laughs> yeah, we do. We do. So, yeah. Lots of candles. That's so, our platinum package, Adam, yeah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> this one's on me, but uh, this one you're going to have to pay for. All right. <laughs> so the, the, the idea was is that I was changing the way his brain perceived the environment. I put smell, a very uh, strong essential oil up one nostril, and you guys remember his gait changed through that process. So the body's, the brain is always evaluating and adapting. And the other thing that's not accounted for is gravity. And it was, it's hilarious because, you know, we, we think about us being in a gravitational environment. So if we're in gravity, what physics says is that the highest point of force is the bottom of my feet because I'm standing there. But since we're actively standing against gravity using our muscles, the highest point of tension is the top of the head. So if you want to find a problem in the body, and one of our philosophies and theories, because as, as somebody who's done body work, um, you would know that there are things that just don't make sense. Like you're told, you feel muscles rotate. And how can a mechanical muscle rotate? It just, if it's connected here and connected there, and that's all that happens, how does it rotate in, in, uh, in the fascial sheath? And the other thing too is like when, we, in you, when you release a muscle like in a leg, why does it deflate? Like one leg looks smaller than the other when you, when you, when you do that. It's visible. You, anybody can see it with their naked eye. And <clears throat> there's a lot of things that are said about their body. It's just the way the body is. And so at the human garage, anytime somebody says that's the way the body is, that's a full stop for us. That's uh, okay. That means that somebody didn't have any answer. Somebody didn't want to understand the answer and we're going to go figure it out. Yeah, the, th- the thing that I find that's frustrating in just our, our the Western uh, idea of uh, the human body and is the separation between, you know, your mind and your body and your emotional state. All the systems. As they if, separate all the systems. Yeah, as if they're, they're completely independent to the point where, you know, um, mental illness is treated as a disease of the mind, but maybe not as a disease of the body, whereas it's all, it's all, it's all connected. It's all the same thing. Think of intrinsic, extrin- extrinsic nervous system, your brain and your gut. If, you, if you're sick, it's the same thing. It's like literally the same cord. So if you're sick at one end, you're sick at the other. Well, we were just talking yeah. about this uh, a couple episodes ago, in fact, where you know we have this, uh, this health epidemic, uh, this poor health epidemic that's been happening now for a few decades. Obesity is one of the side effects, diabetes, you know, autoimmune disease. Um, but you're also seeing, and nobody's talking about mental illness, uh, skyrocket right alongside with it. And it's totally expected. It's totally expected to see an increase in anxiety, which I believe now, if I'm not mistaken, anxiety now is the most, the highest diagnosed, you know, e- emotional mental disorder. It is, but anxiety very specifically is a threat to the vital organs and it's when norepinephrine and noradrenaline appear at the same time and it can always be tracked to a, to a compression in the rib cage, especially a rib that's out. Uh, we People come in all the time with anxiety and within minutes we can relieve it, but it's what caused it. It's tightness, it's compression in the body, it's torquing and winding, it's the body trying to adapt. But anxiety itself is very specific and we try to treat things like anxiety by going to the brain. And the job of the brain is not, it's, if science is even coming to the point where they're saying the brain doesn't store anything. <clears throat> the brain just runs programs. It's a CPU. So if the brain, if I, have, if I have stress or I have fear, it's my body feeling it. My brain's giving me the experience. And the way, I don't know, have you guys ever heard of uh, our, have, in natural medicine, it's very well documented that organs have a relationship to emotions. Mm-hmm. Like liver, mm-hmm. his anger, adrenals. So where all this started to come uh, uh, really relevant. It's funny, it's funny you say that, by the way, because we feel love where? Yeah. In our heart, in heart. our chest. yeah, And, and you in, feel fear. In your it, gut. Because mm-hmm. it's a future. Yeah. So the way I look at the body is there's three portals, not six chakras. I'm not saying that there's not variations, but basically everything in the future you feel here. 
in the gut. Everything in the past you feel here. In the body. And everything in the present you feel right in the heart. The heart. Yeah, so hmm. if we just start to think of it, recontextualize the whole experience of how we look at the Which human body. It's really hard for a lot of people listening to like attach themselves to because well, they feel woo-woo well, about so it, let right? me, because we So let me take what you just said and I'm going to uh, uh, try and translate it to see if it'll make sense to people. So you said how you know, anxiety is coming from the body, then the brain is what determines its anxiety experience, or experiences, experiences it. it yeah. So here's a great example I think anybody can uh, can understand. Anxiety and excitement uh, are the same physically. It's the same physical yes. response. Yes. You have the same release of you know you know chemicals. You have the same hormone changes. You have the same uh, experience on a body level. It's your brain that tells you it's anxiety or I'm excited. It's the same, but it's but but it's how you basically per- perceive, perceive it. it. Yes, yeah. Perception is everything, mm. and that's why when people come and they and they you know like when I, I did the work on you at the garage, Adam, and and you walk, I ask you what your experiences are. And you'd be surprised at different countries because we have people come from Japan, from the UK, from South America. They use, even in their own language or in English, they use the same exact descriptors to describe what they're feeling or experiencing. And we've done this, you know, tens of thousands of times, and it's always the same thing over. It's because the brain is trying to interpret the the environment. Where this all really came, uh, we've been pushing pressure out of the gut without knowing what we were doing for about three years. But where it all came into a real relative is I'd read this report on um, on PMS as an international study and it was talking about and I don't know where actually I where I actually got it it was it was a, it was in a medical journal or something that came up on my phone and I, and I hit it and it talked about their experiences and that seventy five percent of the women experience anger first and then they experience fear or sorry uh, sadness and then fear now if you look at the the way the anatomy stacked up, when uh, when a female gets uh, her period, their uterus grows to three times its size. And what that does is it's blood rushing in, causing a pressure buildup. And the first thing uh, that hits is the is the liver. The second thing it hits is the kidneys. Third thing it hits is the adrenals. My wife was saying um, one day, she's just uh, right before a cycle, she says, I'm sad. And I just instinctively reached over and pushed the pressure out of her belly. And she gets up and says, I'm not sad anymore. That's weird. And that was where everything came together for me. It was like, okay, now there's there's more to this than I thought originally. So we started working with moving pressure around the body. And uh, if you were to squat right now, um, I guess it's impractical for us to do this. Yeah. We'll do it later. But if you were to squat, initially you'll feel all the pressure around <laughs> right around the lower rib cage. And, and over three to five minutes, that pressure will start to dissipate. So what happened? What it is, is that there's two holes in the top of the diaphragm, one for the esophagus and one for the arteries. And those holes are covered with a piece of uh, connective tissue, kind of like saran wrap. And through there, through the hole, it pokes the esophagus. And that, that acts as a pressure relief valve because the, you think about the, the diaphragm, it's about this big and it's a suction cup. <laughs> Can you imagine a suction cup this big? You could hold up a car. <laughs> And so there's a lot of pressure that's being dysregulated in the body. And we started moving pressure around the body, even depressurizing organs manually. So like a manual release, like you do in a muscle, we're doing with every one of the organs now. And what's incredible is it shows up immediately in blood work and subclinical work right away. Like you can see a difference before and after. And and it's not a little difference. It's, it's a big difference. Now, this mm. th- there is a feedback loop though, right? Because if your body's causing something that you're perceiving as <clears throat> anger or whatever, you, can the reverse also happen? I was just going to ask, I, is your theory then that it's always physical? It's always physical? Well, my theory is we feel the world around us. Mm-hmm. And so um, as a kid growing up, I didn't like to be in audiences. I didn't like to be in large groups of people. I mean, I liked it. I liked the excitement of people, but I would go through these raging emotions. I go through fear, anger, sadness, and I just thought that was normal. And I just didn't like to be around people because of the, the changing emotions. What I was feeling that I didn't know it was I was feeling everybody else. It's like when somebody walks in a room and they're real angry. Well, what, if you, what if you could feel every emotion that somebody has that's within a reasonable proximity of you? It, just, it was like, for me, it was like going crazy. And uh, so what we can create an experience in our brain. So like, let's say we have a memory. Okay, we draw from something. And I remember uh, something, somebody I'm angry at. That memory can then spark up in an emotion in my body. And that's what you're talking about right now, right? Well, it's still, it's, it's, we're, we're still saying both ways. It's, it's not both ways, it's all together. So it really doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You know, there is, there is an outside stressor, perceived real or not. Like, for example, you're sitting in a car and the car beside you moves and you're parked. 
and it feels like you're moving. Every single bone, every muscle, all your organs, everything, all your adrenaline, everything fires as if you're moving. And so it doesn't really matter. It's your perception. And that was back to your, your, your statement earlier. It's really the perception that you have that makes a difference between excitement and anxiety, right? Mm. Mm. And so it's how we perceive the world around us. What started to happen to us is we started to take that ability to feel and put it into the therapy, uh, therapeutic process. In other words, feeling what people are feeling. And so that's how we're able to go through and do the work. And I know it sounds uh, where you get in that area where it sounds woo-woo. You guys have heard applied kinesiology or muscle testing. I, you know what? It's bugged me for years. Why do we call it muscle testing? I mean, we're not testing a muscle. We're, te- we're asking the body if it wants something. And we use it at scale, so our entire staff does it. And mm. it's like a language. And when you use it over and over again, it's very accurate. So that's how we know where to work on. That's how I knew what to do for you, Adam. Because mm-hmm. I wasn't, I didn't, you didn't see me doing lots of testing or range of motion testing. I went right at to where you had a problem. And, I just, and your body told me what to do, and I just worked on it. So you had a lot of, uh, you know, like revelations as far as like paradigm shifts with, with internal pressure and... Um, can you also describe, like, you're describing fascia and what you've learned with fascia sure. and kind of get our audience up to date with that? Well, as you guys saw us while we we're, while we're working, I was like having one person <laughs> I, rub your tummy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in a certain direction. So they, so what we... Which I have Sal do that to me all the time yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. 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 great Sal. He's, yeah, he's a professional. Only on Wednesdays. Yeah. <laughs> So, so we, 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 you know, like a lot of things, uh, necessity is the mother of all invention and experimentation is what, what gives us the uh, incentive to move forward. So when, when we noticed that we would touch the body in certain areas, muscles would release really fast. Then, then we started noticing something else as we were delivering the therapy that we would feel it in our bodies where they needed to, where their fascia needed to be uh, either touched or moved or stretched. And then it's, and then, then we would tell an assistant, what you didn't see is our normal production. You, you guys were at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. So normally there's two to three people at every station. And so I'd have an assistant working with me. And then if he doesn't feel it, I'd tell him, I'd say it's in the back of the head over here. You touch it and then your quad would release. So we've learned. What do you, whole- what do you mean you feel it? Literally feel it. It feels like it's a sensation. Like, tele- like, like you telepathically feel what the other person's feeling? I don't think telepathically is the right word. Okay. I just I just think it's like uh, when someone walks into a room and they're angry, you feel it, you turn around. It's that same sensory perception. It's just more finely tuned. Mm. And What's interesting about that too is uh, we do know that the amount of information that you, that, you're, that you perceive is a tiny fraction of all the information that you're actually taking in. Correct. Oh, it's, it's, like, it's like 90 to 10%. It's like or crazy, it's, like more, like yeah, more, like ninety percent. No, probably I, bigger. No, 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 I just literally, I'm reading that in. Uh, God, what is? What am I reading right now? What's the name of that book? Um, fuck, what's it called? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I just started. No, it I just, I they were just reading. I was just reading a study on this, and it, they say I think it was ninety or ninety five percent. Uh, of the information that our brain is downloading, like is unconscious. Well, first of all, I don't. I just want to take a step back and say I, I, I understand what they're saying. I don't think it's the brain. The body feels everything and records everything. I mean, uh, Harvard uh, released that preliminary report last year, was which is saying that trauma was stored in the fascial network. And what we know that trauma is subconscious. It's not conscious. We're not thinking about it all day long. So what they're saying without saying it is your body is your subconscious and your brain is your consciousness, which starts to make sense if we were to delineate it that way. And so you have information. Your body records every temperature change, every noise, every sound, every light variation, uh, atmospheric pressure. We know that I can show you a newspaper and then under hypnosis, you can read it back word for word. So that means it's storing everything, every sight, our, the way we uh, the way we feel, what we touch, the wind that blows us is stored from the day that we're conceived to the day that we die. Think about how many trillions of terabytes of information is in our body. We don't have a computer on the planet Earth that can store that information. And here we're doing it in these bodies that we walk around with every day. That's what's pretty cool about it. Now, fascia, interesting thing about it is it's 100 trillion cells. So it has uh, where the brain, uh, intrinsic and extrinsic nerve system, the gut are 100 billion cells. So the fascia is a thousand times more organically dense than the brain is. That, and the way that I see the body is, uh, is that organic density, the things that have more density are more important to the ecostructure of the body. And you just look at that from organ to organ, from piece to piece, you'll notice that things that, that are really important to the body, there's just a lot of activity around it. And so that means the, the fascia really in our model is what's telling the, telling the brain what to do. And 
we know that uh, we know that uh, emotions are connected to organs. Like for example, when you get hungover, uh, your liver's working too hard. So that and the next day you get up, it's like, oh man, everything's agitating. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. Simple tasks seem hard. That's all because my liver is agitated. It's pissed off. And so, so the way I see it is, is that is that the muscles and the fascia is the and through that network is all the memories. The organs provide the emotional experience. So like if so, I have a memory of a, something I'm angry at here stuck in a quad. That's why body workers known this for you know, thousands of years. People will cry during body work and have memories and stored emotions. We know that that's a fact. So so what the way I see it happening is that the memories in the quad. And then it, and then at the speed of light, it connects with the uh, the liver, which is the reference to the emotion. And then the brain pull, and it comes up to the brain. The brain gives you the experience. And when you start looking at the body that way, then all of a sudden these mechanical issues and these performance issues start to start to change the way we perceive them and the way that we handle them. So I have a question about uh, about the because I've I've read a lot of, of theories on how people say certain emotions or, or memories are stored in the body, um, and I've heard uh, counters. Uh, for example, you're saying you know if you push on a particular part of the body, the person will have an emotion, which I've experienced as well. I've I've trained people and I've seen that as well. Yeah, could it also be just that you're almost priming the person because you're touching an area that relates to a particular emotion or a feeling. It reminds them no different than when I walk into a, a, a you know an old classroom and I have that smell. It reminds right. me when I was in third grade. Right. Um, you know, could that also be possibly happening? Well, so it, it is. It's, I mean, you, we, we well documented science neuro linguistic programming. I mean, Anthony Robbins is NLP. <laughs> And so at the position of your eyes during certain statements, uh, so when people, the position of your eyes during fearful events, when we're doing the neurological rehabilitation with people, every once in a while, you'll get them in a, in a spot where they'll turn their head, they'll move their eyes, and then all of a sudden, it'll be like they saw a ghost. Fear comes out or anger or something like that. And you had a couple of little experiences on the table in that short time that we were there, I think. When you were sticking your finger in my mouth, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fucking hurt, man. Or, or, or it I, was what you what you did was I remember when uh, you were applying pressure, and then then all of a sudden you you didn't relieve. In fact, you were continuing to increase the pressure, but I no longer felt the pain there anymore. Right, which that was probably one of the more fast because I I remember thinking like, oh, he must be letting up on me, and you're like, no, I'm. And then I could see the way your elbow was moving into me that you were giving me more pressure, yeah. but I wasn't feeling that anymore. And that's because your brain is adapting to the environment. So the difference between what we do in our therapy, not to deviate too far from your question earlier, mm-hmm. is, is we provide a, lo- a series of logical problems that your body has to adapt to. That's the therapy. So your body compensates around issues it perceives as problems. And so what we do is we create problems that your body at the compensation is actually what we want is the corrective measures. And that's why it works really fast. I mean, <laughs> Did you post those pictures from? I didn't post them, but I have them. I do have them. I should put them up on on one of our pages. It's a little it's a little hard to believe that that can happen in that short a time. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, when people see uh, the two by two pictures, if they go to our social media, it's always the consultation. I don't say that because for re- realistically, no one's going to believe that. There's no nobody in physical medicine that's going to believe that in 45 minutes you can create that kind of result. But mm-hmm. it was just engaging the body in a different way. Instead of me telling your body what I want it to do, I'm giving it the chance to resolve an issue that it perceives as a problem. And then the logic for us was what what issue creates what result? And that, that's our math or our formula, our special sauce. Yeah, remind me when we when we had the fingers in my mouth, what on my body are we addressing? Uh, lateral and medial pterygoids. And then we're dealing with uh, one of the... Yeah, sorry. There's so many muscles up here. Well, you can be general yeah. about it. We don't have to be specific about exactly what neck muscle. So a one, muscle in my neck. Yeah, two for the jaw and one for the hyoid bone. Because okay. So your your brain takes inputs from, like, for example. So this we was have, because we, we, we when we took the picture, so the audience knows, I had a crooked face that I didn't know about. Yeah. and it, what, So we were fixing my crooked face. And it fixed it. Yeah, no, I was definitely. I can fix your crooked face. I was too, like, a, I was like a, a nine before, and I was like a nine and a half afterwards. You fixed it's me. It's going to hurt more. Not quite a perfect 10 yet. Justin <laughs> yeah. has a perfect 10 face. <laughs> oh, you know. <laughs> it's I was right. blessed. It's very Hashtag nasty. blessed. So uh, <laughs> do, you, do you study things like, the, you know, fascinating cases like phantom limb syndrome and 
some of those situations because well, they seem very you know in in the case of phantom limb you have someone who loses an arm and they feel it's still there and in fact they feel the arm in this clenched kind of painful position even though there is no arm yeah well we we even work with um uh like um it started back in 2012 taking people that had uh, spinal cord compression so in other words they're quadrupe- quadriplegic but they didn't have a sever and we would get them to uh, we would get them to to in their mind drive the motion and we would create the movement and resistance and uh, it was just an experiment and uh, a gentleman that hadn't used his hands in 26 years you know after doing that for a week and a half started using his hands for the first time and what that is, is a, it's the signal, it's really how does that signal getting to the muscle? And I question some of the things that we're taught. Like if you look at the proprioceptive model of walking, how long it takes a nerve signal to get from the brain to the foot, back up to the brain to say it's okay to let the other foot go, and that back and forth, contralateral motion is really tough for the brain to do. So if you clench your jaw right now, you'll feel it in your right foot. Clench your right jaw, and you'll feel it instantaneously in your right foot. So... In the nervous system, information travels around the speed of sound and just above it. And in the fascial system, it travels beyond our ability to measure it, the speed of light. And proprioceptively, if you run a math model, we, we're not, we can't walk by math. So there's something else going on that, that we just said that's the way it is. And the fascia is always signaling to the brain. It's always taking information, all kinds of experiences, whether it's the walking, the ground, the surface, the air. Like, I, I don't know if I, uh, if I did this to you, but here, do me a favor. Now, I didn't tell you to push back. But it just it's natural instinct. Even if, even if a wind starts blowing heavily, you lean into it. And it's because your, your fascia is communicating to the brain in, in milliseconds and, and adapting all of your muscles and body towards it. And that's, a, that's an experience that we've just taken completely out of the whole therapy model and out of the whole sports and performance model. And you know, as we've been starting to work with a lot more professional athletes, um, uh, some of them, like, well, some of the Olympic runs we can, some of the pro athlete teams I can't mention yet um, until next year, just because of some negotiations we're going through. But, but like Lashinda Demas, she's a two-time Olympic medalist, a world record holder, 400-meter hur- hurdle. It's, we were, as we start to move her back into motion, she wasn't able to run. Um, that was two months ago. And now she had she, an injury? Yeah. A multitude of injuries. Okay. Yeah, multitude of injuries. It's just uh, like a lot of, she's 34 years old. I think she's 34, right? Lashinda, if you're out there. Sorry. <laughs> Hope I got the right. She looks like 23. Yeah. 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 You know, 34 years old, twin 10-year-olds. Wow. And, uh, and a world-class runner, right? And so she was not able to run or even jog a couple months ago. And she's not only running, but when you bring the body back into performance and alignment, the brain does less math to complete the task that it has to complete. And when the brain's doing less mask, math, we are get more throughput of the signal to the muscles and the muscles perform better. So in, like, in, uh, in her case, she's not only going to run, I think it looks like she's going to PR. It's funny too because when uh, for for if you've ever done any sports or if you've ever done even you know anything physical where you've done it enough times, you know that you do it better when you don't think. Correct. You just move and and you know call it the zone or whatever. You know, the if zone. I start to think too much about what I'm doing. Um, then I actually decrease my performance. That's kind of a cool topic, and you're probably a really fun person to talk about. Uh, how familiar are you with the flow state, and what, what's your theory on that? We live in the flow state. Uh, like Legitimately, the majority of the day that I'm working, I'm in the flow state because I'm f- we're feeling we have to be present in order to help people at the, at the level we do. So once you're a motion mechanic on our tables, we call ourselves motion mechanics because we analyze and repair motion. Basically, if you're, if you're walking correctly, you can't hide mal- malfunctions in motion. So if you're walking correctly, you have no pain. And everything that's not working when you walk, that's what we're trying to fix. And, and so the whole, the whole idea of... of um, How often do you have someone take their shoes off, walk across that floor like you had me do... And you guys all marvel at like, what a beautiful gait. Like, <laughs> does that ever happen? Does that ever so, happen? Or is it like, yeah. oh man, she's fucked up, dude. This no, is it's, we, got it's, a long, we got a long day today. It starts off with, yeah, they're fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did no one ever yeah. no one ever impresses you? Is it rare that you, wow. is, how often does someone, No unicorns in the mix? Yeah, as I say, there's never a person who walks in. I haven't met anybody yet. 
You guys ever seen a pretty squat the first time? Yeah, <laughs> good point. Yeah. Excellent yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He so, said, have you guys ever seen a, a, a pretty squat the first time? No, most people, the first time they squat is horrific. So we're, yeah. so we're, yeah. we're, we're, bo- we're born with called synaptic optimized programs. They're things that, that are hardwired into us. Like walking is the hardest thing for the human being to do. But we don't think about it because it's hardwired. And we learn to, uh, we're supposed to learn to crawl, walk, and run. Mm-hmm. I had a wooden floor, uh, had little jumpers, and I never crawled. Yeah. And I think part of my issue later on in my life was fixing stuff up was the fact that I never repaired the call. Now I have, I have. Is that a true story? Or you just use that as an example? No, it's a true story. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. It's like we had wooden floors and I had these little scoot and I just would scoot around the floors. And one day I got up and ran. Isn't that fascinating how, you know, our parents can make a decision like that, that they wouldn't even think twice of. <laughs> right. Is doing such a any, crucial part. Right. Your, or yeah. taking a kid with Motor with learning. his arms and swinging him around in a circle, right. Right. pulling the arms out of socket and right. stretching or, the tendons. Or, uh, or as, soon as, he, <coughs> as soon as he comes out, already throwing on his new Oops. pair of Jordans. Yeah. He's already got a pair of sneakers on his feet as soon as he's born, right? We do all kinds of crazy things. And, uh, you know, it's funny because I am now, for the last... Um, Whatever, it's fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for the last three years, I, um, uh, for the last three years, I didn't train at all. Uh, basically, two things. I, I I was I was working, and uh, in order to get this to where it was, we we had limited ability to deliver therapy. Um, <clears throat> today we have almost forty employees, and uh, but uh, two a year ago we had like uh, nine or ten, and a year before that there's three of us. So basically, we were the workhorses, and we were providing all of the therapy. So. I wasn't able to actually do a lot of the things I would to, to maintain myself. And then I had not been working out for about a year at this point. And I'm starting to feel myself become more and more aligned, meaning I need less and less of my own therapy. And I said, I'm just going to wait this out. And so I just uh, started my own rehab with Ryan over here. He is, uh, he's one of our progression specialists and he's a master progression specialist, means he's trained in multiple disciplines. And that's why these guys are here, by the way, is because they can do almost everything that we do in-house. Mm. And um, so the idea is I just started my own rehab. And it, the crazy thing was to go back into motion and start moving again for the first time. And it's very corrective. So what mm. we're doing is uh, we're building neurological and, um, and proprioceptive uh, exercises and activities for me to reverse the, the winding patterns that my body had. So did you literally go back to like crawling patterns and kind yep. of start with that? Yep. I've been on the floor mm-hmm. and it feels, you know, from a guy who spent his life as a, you know, working out in gyms. A bodybuilder. A bodybuilder. Yeah. It's like for me to go back. And I was saying to Ryan the other day. If talk I, about talk about how humbling that is, how hard that is. Because like, a lot yeah. of people struggle with this because we're so caught up in aesthetics and the way I look. And, and hitting PRs. And, right. So let, that's actually very, very humbling. I'll get to that. But if you train for aesthetics or strength, your alignment will suffer. But if you train for alignment, which we do, then aesthetics and strengths will be there. Mm. And that's really important. And what happened is me humbling going back, I'm doing activities which I can barely do, like lifting one leg off the ground when I'm on one other leg. I mean, crazy, crazy things that that would just be a normal part of developing or growing up, which I never had. And um, it's humbling. Um, If I was to go back and do it without help, there's no way. I would go back to my own way of doing it. I'm, I was sitting there thinking, would I go through this activity? And I try to go in on days that I'm not scheduled to be in to, for, uh, for our biomechanics. I'll go in on a day and try and work out myself. And I just won't put myself through it yet. It's, 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 it's humbling. It's hard. Talk it's, about your, your, your history. Like, how did you, because you used to be a bodybuilder. Yeah. I mean, you, you did tell us quite a bit about your history, but I think it'd be important for the audience to hear a little bit about that. So bodybuilder, um, I was a, I was a junior and competed junior, senior at the same time, which is really rare because I was at 19, 20 years old that had the physique of the guys who were like 35. And, um, I went to the Canadian nationals. Um, and now were you training naturally or were you anabolically enhanced? Okay. At this point? Uh, up to the nationals, I was, uh, natural and at the nationals you're anabolically enhanced and you mm-hmm. can see the difference. I mean, my quads went to 30. You kind of, you got to have to, right? I mean, that, that was my experience as I was competing. Once you get up to like, yeah, you don't have you the don't national have and professional level. I mean, that's an interesting question too. Does the use of anabolic hormones Hor- change? Horribly messed me up. Mm. Yeah. Horribly. Yeah. Oh, so. It, you, there's so let's just talk about what you can do naturally and I'm almost sure. 50 and uh, my hair used to be completely white uh, it's growing back into its natural color my testosterone count we had the conversation on the way over here my testosterone count was in the 200s five years ago today it's in the 900s Whoa. according to medicine what happened for me is medically impossible like it's a miracle and 
And so whenever we add something exogenously to our body, it, it, uh, what it does is the body has reaction because the brain is adapting. And it doesn't matter, even if it's good. I mean, we were taught in America, if it's good, more of it's gooder. <laughs> that's, mm-hmm. that's simply not true. Right. I mean, you, you know, the funniest thing, uh, we see people, everybody who has a, our thing is everybody comes into the garage with a white uh, jug of water or at the gym with a white jug of water is usually dehydrated because <laughs> they're, they're, they're drinking so much water, they, they're taking all their sodium out. Mm-hmm. And what's the term for that? Overhydration? No, when the dehydrates by drinking. Somebody said it the other day. <laughs> drinking um. too much. So what happens is one molecule, I might, I might not be precise on the science, but basically one molecule of, of water uh, holds three molecules of sodium. And if you don't have enough sodium in your system, as the water comes through, it collects the sodium and you pee it out. And then you have no water to hold, your, hold the water in your oh, system. Oh, yeah. Runners have known this for a little while now where they'll drink too much <clears throat> water and they'll cramp up. And Correct. now they're starting to sprinkle you know, sea salt in there. Yeah, in their water. Exactly. It's all so. The point is, it's about balance, and we've got lots of biohackers out there that are uh, exogenously biohacking. They're using all kinds of things external to us to create effect in the environment. And what we like to think of ourselves as is endogenous biohackers. So we use our hands and we create all these effects without the use of all these tools and lasers. And you didn't see any lasers, and you saw lots of technology around when you came into the garage, but you didn't see. <laughs> Uh, laser treatment, you didn't see a bunch of equipment, a mm-hmm. um, bunch of machines, and we're producing these results by encouraging the body to do what it's designed to do. So aside from the negative feedback loop where your hormones start to decrease your own endogenous production, <coughs> or what other things will happen when somebody, because you know we have a large fitness audience and there's a percentage of them that take anabolic steroids. What are some other things that are happening to the body besides the, you know, your body stops producing its own testosterone? So we, we all know that there's a liver issue that happens. Once, and, and once we start having a liver issue and it's been there for about a year and a half, then the body starts having problems digesting and processing protein. And so, um, so the protein, so by taking without supporting, like there's choices everybody has to make. If you're, if, if you're going to go outside and it's raining, you should wear, wear a raincoat or suffer the consequences, right? So if you're going to take anabolic steroids, then you need to have something to compensate on the other side. And so the idea is the body's always trying to find a balance. And if we don't do something to help that body find a balance by adding something, even things like uh, we get a lot of people, CrossFitters come in and, uh, you know, they're taking, you know, five milligrams of creatine a, uh, a day and they're... Um, They've been doing it as for five grams a day, and they've been doing it for you know two years, and their livers are shot and their adrenals are shot, and they don't understand why. And it's because the body is not designed to take all of that. And if you if you are taking it, you need to find some way to counteract the imbalances. So so if you're taking hormones, you're going to have issues with your liver, your kidneys, your adrenals. Uh, it'll also affect uh, inflammation markers. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> so uh, hormones will show up and start causing pressure on the heart. I mean, and you you guys know the deal. I sure. Mean, and then what you know, the testosterone's effect on muscle, and of course, muscle, and you know, even fascia. And at those at the doses that uh, even low to moderate uh, doses that athletes will use is set, you know a hundred times higher than what the body will naturally produce anyway. Correct. So the body has to have a compensation for it. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad. The body doesn't like, like for this whole thing lately has been pH versus, you know, like alkaline versus acidic, right? Mm-hmm. Somebody wrote a, a report 20 years ago saying that uh, all the bad diseases happened in an acidic body. And then all of a sudden we're testing all these people. We're testing thousands of people that don't think they're sick yet because we test everybody who comes to the garage. So we have a much different sample size than most doctors would have, Right. And what we've noticed is that almost everybody in our market anyways, because it's uh, Venice Beach, is over-alkaline. And that, that, that produces other problems. Like, for example, undigested food, because of the, it needs the acidity, uh, you need 4.0 or, or more acidic in the stomach to digest food properly. And so undigested food goes into the small intestines. That's where autoimmune disease start coming in. It's having- funny that we think about this with uh, the, the human, or people <clears throat> for years have thought that way with the human body when we know... Uh, a plant, when a plant is at the perfect pH balance or homeostasis, it doesn't get attacked. It could go alkaline or acidic. If it gets out of that perfect balance, yeah. it's vulnerable. Everything happens. So there's, a, I'm glad you brought it up. It's interesting because we're about to tell everybody what Adam I'm, used to grow weed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not even joking. That's where <laughs> that all comes that. from. It that's applies to everything. <laughs> so. That's true. So, right. so here's a funny thing is we've been working with uh, Cure Ecology Labs uh, as our subclinical lab. And we do all the labs that you get in any other functional doctor, uh, functional medicine doctors. Matter of fact, uh, one of our new doctors, uh, 
<clears throat> Dr. Legos, he's an integrative medicine doctor, mm -hmm. also works at ER um, in, in uh, LA and integrative medicine in Santa Monica. He's our new in-house uh, DO. And what's, what's interesting is <clears throat> how they are looking at um, the interactions between the different ways of looking at the body testing, all clinical procedures, tests, um, are sick tests. So you go get a blood test at a doctor, it's telling you you're sick or not because blood has a very narrow margin in which, it, which, which you can move out of. And if you move out of that, you're either sick or dead. So we do the subclinical test and for years, the lab was, af was afraid to defend the science behind the test. A guy named Dr. Uh, Casey as a friend of Albert Einstein's created this test and he was, um, he was an MD and a chem uh, chemist, biochemist. And he was uh, trying to optimize soil performance so that soil could provide life. And he would, he would use this test to find out what was missing so he could give the soil so that the plants would grow. And then the uh, animals eat the plants, we eat the animals and plants, and elements transfer up the, f up the food chain, right? That's how we get the elements. That's how we get all, this, all the things that we need in our body. Well, what happens if the soil doesn't ha is missing certain base elements like some of the cell salts? You know, like uh, uh, potassium chloride, sodium, <coughs> uh, carbonate, stuff like that. Sure. All the different cell salts, if it's missing, those things are important balancers for our electromagnetic, for the way our body works. So the test that we use, our, our primary health test is actually used to be a soil test. And what we're looking at is interstitial fluid because our body's about 79% interstitial fluid and about 21% blood cells. So blood. So before it ever gets before it ever gets to the blood, it's in the interstitial fluid, which is our soil, our human soil. So we started, we have a really unique test, and we, we do is we look at your human soil and we say, what are you missing? And we go backwards downwards, because he figured, well, How if do I you test the human soil. Well, we do it through urine and saliva. Okay. We're testing interstitial fluid. Got and it. then that we, we can look at things like, are you digesting properly? Are you able to absorb carbohydrates and proteins? And this is where you start to see a different picture because you go in and the doctor says everything's fine. What are you, what, what's common? What are you seeing a lot? When you're, when you're looking under the hood and you guys are looking at people's soil, what are the most common things that you guys are seeing? Some of the first things that come up um, is, uh, first of all, everybody in LA has a, uh, well, I guess up here too, probably. Everybody in, uh, in LA has an adrenal issue. And if we, because we have people coming from all over the world, if they're coming from Canada and they're coming from London, their adrenals aren't looking that bad. And I'll, I'll go into some reasons why I think that is. Um, <clears throat> most people have a liver issue of some sort, um, either overworking or underworking, things like antibiotic use, uh, just general life. You know, we always associate liver with drinking alcohol. I mean, antibiotics are 100 times worse for your liver than alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing uh, most people are, are too uh, uh, alkaline, causing other series of problems in the body. And those are the common ones. Um, <clears throat> and... Oh, and inflammation, our circulatory flow. A lot of people have low, low cellular uh, uh, inflammation, which is circulatory flow to smooth tissues, uh, heart, uh, GI tract, sex organs, stuff like that. So those are the common ones we're seeing. And, and there are, we've noticed that it's actually coming from different parts of the country and different cities. You get different behaviors. Uh, like New York and L.A., Adrenals are all fatigued. Now, how do you how are you extracting this from from the soil? Right, I'm trying to envision like what I used to have to do with the parts per million in the soil for my plant. I'm like, okay, this same is, kind of idea. But it, we're, if you can look at the soil and say, what does the soil need? You can go upstream, right, and just look at what it needs going back downstream, right. And so, and this guy was uh, it was funny because they they said to Albert Einstein, you know, you're really good at breaking all these things apart into these little pieces, but you can't put it all back together again. He said, well, if you want to put it back together again, you got to go to Dr. Casey. He's the guy that puts things back together. And this is Albert Einstein saying about this guy. And this test has been buried for decades and used by a few practitioners. But we found it the best way to get a second view data point on a client, especially if we have an issue. Like a lot of people just need a little bit of health correction. But if we have a serious issue starting to develop, it's nice to know. Um, and another way to look at it maybe would be this, is that a normal medical test would tell you how fast your car is driving. It's going 60 miles an hour. And then we put you on the road with everybody else. Everybody's going 60, so you're within range. That does not mean healthy. <laughs> and you know that. It just means within range. It's like uh, the average American breathes 15 breaths per minute, but clinically, we hyperventilate after 12. Mm -hmm. So uh, so just because we do something doesn't mean it's right or because it's in within range. Well, if a standard blood test would test the speed of your car, ours would test the speed of your engine. 
How many RPM are you doing? So it's, it's taking a look at the environment, seeing how hard is the environment working, because eventually that environment leads to the end result, which is, which is uh, the blood and what happens in the blood. So, so eventually, that's the way that we that we've started looking at it. It was really interesting because when we started, we just thought it was a, we were just told it's a subclinical test, and we didn't understand the science behind it. But we just saw that it worked. And you know, you go into a chiropractor or or to a naturopath, and they do a bunch of tests, and they, you walk out with a big bucket of supplements. That's kind of the deal, right? Our whole our belief is is that with Supplements should only be taken as medication and should be taken for a specific achieved result, only till that result is achieved, and should be somewhere between somewhere between three, six, or nine months, and, and then from there, a functional food takes over. Do you guys start with uh, nutrition advice as well, or is that something that you do? <clears throat> we do, on? yeah. For every single person that comes to the door, we do lab work. Uh, we do full body assessments. Uh, we do alignment process. We can fix injuries like a shoulder or a back or our leg or knee. We can make things feel good really fast, but we, we've made a decision corporately that if somebody's not going to engage in repairing their whole body, then we might as well not start because we're just causing another problem somewhere else in their body. So we do the entire alignment process with everybody. Hmm. I want to know how, how has this journey been for you to, to build this business? Now, obviously, you guys are having lots of success. Tons of people are seeing incredible results. But I have to believe that when you first started, there had to have been this some growing pains that you went through. How many did you ever piss anybody off or make somebody feel like this is really weird or woo woo or I don't believe this is parlor yeah, sure. tricks? I'm out of here. Like, was there a, a sure. period that you went through that or what was that like? Yeah, in the early days, uh, you know, the first year and a half. I mean, you got to think about how this started. Um, I had a, <clears throat> I had two uh, sports medicine clinics and one in Beverly Hills and one in Orange County. And I, I was using this therapy um, that, was, that was part of as a neuromuscular therapy that was done in the clinic. And I was using that to maintain myself, but I wasn't getting any better. And so I took one of the therapists and we just started working on my problem, just independently, five days a week um, <clears throat> from about 2 p.m., one or two in the afternoon, all the way to about seven or eight at night. We just do it in my garage in Venice. And people used to walk by and they would, <laughs> they would, they would th they'd see massage tables and they think we're giving each other massages. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> that's what you guys do on Wednesdays? Yes, that's yeah. Wednesdays. Yeah. Wednesdays. That's Wednesdays what we call it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hump day. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you're doing, you're, you guys so, are giving each other massages in your, in your yeah. garage. And people are walking by and you get the same people walk by all the time. And one guy had back surgery and he'd been out for, and he was still in pain. The surgery hadn't done anything for him, which is very common, by the way. And uh, he, you know, kept asking questions. And we uh, finally, when we had what we thought was a protocol, we said, he kept bugging us. And we said, okay, we'll take you as a client. So we treated him in the garage. <laughs> is, that, is that where the name came from? Yeah. That's where oh, okay. the name came from. And so then what happened was, is that uh, it was getting really, so all of a sudden he told a few people who told a few people and then hundreds of people, no business cards, no phone numbers, or just my, my cell phone, no <clears throat> management, practice management system. Just people started showing up phoning all day long, knocking on the door. They just literally knock on the door and say, I got your name from such and such. And so what, what happened is we, I convinced my wife to let us move into the living room just for one day. It was really hot. And then the next day it was hot. And then all of a sudden it was the spare bedroom. <clears throat> and then it was like, okay, take the furniture out of the living room because that couch just cost us 8,000 bucks. And, um, <clears throat> and then we, had, we, uh, we were seeing 300 people a month in an 864 square foot apartment. And that became our clinic and we were there for 18 months. And at that point, the only people that came to us were the ones that had failed in every form of therapy known to mankind. Because why else would you go to a garage? Right. Yeah, or an apartment in Venice, of all places. So yeah. you guys had to stay pretty much underground throughout this whole process, right? We did. Time. Even when we went to the location you're at, we were still underground. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had no website until eight months ago, I think it was. Eight Talk about ago. how hard that has been for you and even that transition right now for you. Because I don't even think, uh, I know we're going to have people that are going to you know Google you guys and look at your website, look at your YouTube right now. And it doesn't give a good representation of the work Correct. you guys are really doing right, right now. We And we're, we're in the process of changing that. I mean, uh, the whole point was we had to put something up and everything that we're doing is new science and we're delivering it. So the way that we deliver it, by the way, is there's, there's codes in each and every state. And we use a BP code in California, which basically says that this is an experimental treatment. 
And we tell you all the things that could happen and all the problems. If you read our waiver, it's pretty extensive. And basically, we're just saying it's an experiment so we can operate outside of the standard of care. That means that we can do things, and the standard of care is really restrictive. It's and the like, purpose for that, so people know, isn't so just so you can make money mm-hmm. off of them. It's so you can start to gather these people, right? And now we can Get really data look at points. Out. Right, right, right. And, and, and talk about money. Our, our, our total cost of treatment, if you were to do the, comp, the similar treatment out there by getting a naturopathic doctor, a chiropractor, physical therapist, um, a trainer, and a nutritionist, our cost of our entire package would be about one third of what you would pay if you're going out there doing it by yourself. The whole idea was to make it, my journey of, of healing myself was really exhaustive. Everything was 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. It was like Monday to Thursday. Talk about that for a second, your journey to heal yourself, because you had your own experience. That's what kind of brought you here, right? Yeah. I mean, it finally came to the point um, that, well, to the point that I was saying earlier is that it was really exhausting. Like we open up right now 8 a.m. and go to 10 p.m. and we're going to go 6 a.m. to midnight eventually. Because we got it's how is it how is it making somebody's life painful to get them out of pain? It just doesn't seem like mm. it should be more convenient. My journey was uh, as a bodybuilder, as we talked started talked about earlier. I fell under a squat, a 600 pound squat, and it was just you know a young kid doing stupid things, and I torqued my back out. And for the rest of my adult life, I spent two to three, four times a week with somebody, an elbow, uh, an adjustment, something to try and make me feel better. And in my 30s, my back would go out, you know, like once or twice a year. But by my mid-30s, it was going out like four, five, six, seven times and got to the point where it went out 10 times one year. And that's 22 weeks, basically, that I'm laid up. And um, I had a number of concussions, some car accidents that happened in between. I'd been traveling for 15 years uh, internationally, the pressurization of planes, which I now know was causing a lot of the problems. Um, I had all these things going on and it got to a point where in, um, in 2010, I actually, I went to use a computer and I looked at a, I looked at a web browser and I could no longer remember how to use a web browser. There's so much neurological stress. And and that's when I, I just, I, it was, it was so fearful. I rolled over and crawled up, curled up in a little ball and cried like a baby for hours because I just thought I'd lost my mind. And um, the next morning I got up and just says, I have to find a way to fix this. And then the other part of the journey, which I'm pretty cool to talk about now, it's, (laughs) it's been a little bit of a rough part, but uh, four years ago, my brother, who was my, my father effectively raised me, committed suicide. Uh, He had 35 years of back pain. And uh, he'd gone the traditional medical route, been in surgery twice, Mm -hmm. pain meds, antidepressants, Abilify, all this stuff on top. And he just basically lost his mind at the end. And, uh, you know, he, he, in his mind, he didn't have the ability to provide for the rest of his life. He couldn't work anymore. We sold his assets at a fire sale for, you know, almost $3 million. And, but that's how the mind works when you're, when you're, propped up on narcotics all the time and mood stabilizers. And that was that would happen right at the time that we were actually starting where we where we started taking clients. And I think that's why I've been so fanatical or maniacal because I really just don't believe that anybody should have to go through that kind of experience. And it's mm-hmm. happening out there all over the place. I mean, we see um, 75% of the people come in with diagnoses that are not correct. And we see people being pushed around from specialist to specialist. Nobody's stick handling. Nobody's got, nobody's the advocate for the, for the, the client. And the client becomes the advocate for themselves. They go to a physical therapist. They says one thing. They go to a nutritionist, say one thing. A doctor says another thing. Chiropractor says another thing. And they take all that information and they take it in what they think is the best and they put it together to create their own little program. That's how it works. Did you mm-hmm. did you understand all this uh, before your brother <clears throat> took his life? Did you know this as you're like coming together? Did you did you no. see were you able to or is it more? Active? I was I was starting to because in the uh, in the sports medicine clinics we were starting to see behaviors and and uh, we're starting you know we were testing people as well. We're using different types of testing, um, and I started seeing that people were sicker than I thought. That was the thing that really got me is that we have right now fifty percent of the people that come to us they they're not going to a doctor right now saying I'm sick. But 50% of them have an autoimmune condition or are on the precipice of it. 75% are not digesting the food properly. I mean, if this was an epi- if this was literally like a virus, schools would be closed down, borders would be shut down, we'd have National Guard deployed, 75% of the, our population is sick. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> but we, it's a silent, silent problem, and, and we're also being confused. I mean, we have arguably more access to... Uh, healthcare, information, shows like you guys. You guys are doing amazing things, by the way. I just want to say, 
Um, I think somebody said the Howard Stern. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and and, and thank you. Coined us with that, yeah. Thank you for doing that. No, because what you're doing is you're setting the you're setting out a benchmark and a difference. You're giving a platform. This, I could go and publish this, which we will. Our science, we're going to publish. We have. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it in a sec. We're going to publish the science, but right now, it's because of people like you and the ability to get the message across that we can deliver this without having to have it peer reviewed. Because who. If, if it works, why are we waiting 10, 15, 20 years to have it delivered? Mm -hmm. right. If it works, it should be, we should be able to deliver it right now. And that was our whole idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have the time. My family didn't have the time to, to wait. So, so I just started delivering the therapy and we found a way to make it happen. Excellent. So uh, what can people do uh, themselves now, <clears throat> people listening? You know, they're hearing all this. They're hearing about this epidemic of autoimmune and, you know, health issues and what can they do? What are some basic things that they can do themselves to prevent that? Well, I think the, the first thing, honestly, is, uh, is, is start to make a decision, to take uh, their health care into their own hands. Um, they have little nagging problems that they're ignoring right now. Everybody does. And they're just things that they just kind of, they just stack on top of each other because the brain's job is to make things normal. So it's, it's start listening to the body, number one. Uh, number two is, if you're not eating organic, it's crazy. You're seeing what I see. There is no way. I mean, and you have to be vigilant about organics. I mean, you, well, we're just in an organic restaurant. <laughs> the funny part about being in this organic restaurant is uh, they have no, or, their organic wine, their wines are not organic. Mm. Well, that's 30 bundles of grapes, which are the highly, most highly dusted crop in the world. And drinking a bottle of wine would be, you could eat non-organic for a whole month of all the other fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. And that one bottle of wine is going to have more of an effect on you. What about, really? whis what about whiskey? <laughs> hey, no, actually, like that. Whiskey's, whiskey's good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Explain yes. that a little bit about the grapes because I know we have a lot of people that probably love and drink wine and, and coffee. Maybe, and maybe eat organic food all day long, but then they oh, wash it down with, coffee, with their dude. favorite hold bottle on, hold on. of wine or coffee. Let's talk about that. Oh, coffee and, gra and wine. Coffee and wine need to be organic uh, vigilant because even the way even wine works is that if they are in eminent fear of losing their crop, they can still get an organic sticker if they use certain pesticides. Mm. It's not that's not cool because if you have an if I didn't know I had a reaction to pesticides until uh, about six months ago. Like I I I started because I drink drink wine or coffee and I was I was a guy that I go <clears throat> and you could find me in a mall. <laughs> by doing that. I'm serious. My kids know it. My family, I've been known my whole life. People would hear me coming a mile away. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I got all of the pesticides out of my body, that all went away. Mm. And, um, and it was, it was something that was distracting. It was very distracting in my life. I'd be on phone calls, muting them all the time, clearing my throat. And the, you know, so when it comes to things like, uh, being organic, especially around pesticides, now, why is it so important? Yeah, okay. what, what is it about the wine and the coffee that's so different than a banana or broccoli? Concentration. Okay. Um, and the amount of pesticides used is way more on wine and, and coffee. But the other the coffee has mold, which is another thing that, that, that you know, jittery feeling is from the mold. It's, mm. not from the, it's not from the coffee. Caffeine doesn't make you feel jittery. It just makes you feel race, like buzzy, but not like shaky. So... What happens is, is Roundup is the primary, uh, is the primary um, uh, pesticide used. And the way Roundup works is it actually erodes the stomach lining of the insect within 24 hours. So the, stomach, so the insect literally starves to death. So the way it works on human beings, trace amounts in our, in our GI tract start to eat the mucal lining in our system and particularly make the small intestines permeable. That's where autoimmune disease comes from because it starts off with, I got a little bit of eczema, I've got a little rash here. I got a little tickle on my throat. Um, you know, and little things, and we just ignore them or we get creams and mm. we make them go away. Well, yeah, pesticides, yeah. Roundup's an herbicide, but herbicides have their own, uh, Sorry. Have their yeah. own issues. Yeah. Because um, I do know that uh, herbicides uh, do, they do not uh, affect the human cells, which is why they got approved, but they do affect bacterial cells. Which we have a huge, which we're most, which, which we're mo <laughs> more bacteria than we are human cells, yeah. and so we totally did not account for that. Uh, which well, is it's like we used to say that sodium monosulfide, uh, the molecules are too big to penetrate uh, the pores in our mouth. So when we used to brush our teeth, that we weren't hurting ourselves. Now we know that that's not true. So there's a lot of things that are scientifically proven, mm. but they're but they're scientifically proven uh, with a point of reference, and you got to look at who's backing the science. Oh, mm. well, we talk oh, about yeah. that all the time. Okay, cool, all yeah. the time. I mean, you. you 
Yeah, and the thing is, we we know, at the absolute best, even with the most uh, benevolent, you know, companies and scientists, and they can be as honest and great uh, as ever. But we only know to test what we know to test. Uh, like like again, we talk about the microbiome. We didn't even know that 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 made a difference. So we didn't even know to test for that before. So we could have done everything right and yeah. tested everything right. And the individual variants is crazy. And, and there's epigenetics that yeah. we don't we we we're just now learning about. So it might be safe on one generation, but three Might generations be, down yeah, now we're having problems so that's why that's why our process is endogenous biohacking we're looking for ways to get the body to do what it's supposed to do based upon the uh, the inputs and information it already has and and I just every time I, I apply anything external to the body there's a reaction and that reaction sometimes can be okay and sometimes can make me feel okay right now like a lot of people uh, for lymphatic drainage they do the vibration plates your nervous system doesn't like the vibration, by the way. Mm. <laughs> That's like, there's other ways to drain your lymphatic system. That is not a good way. Why doesn't the nervous system like vibration? Some women might disagree with you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's uh. specific. <laughs> it's, yes. uh, yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> that made you blush there a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so horny tea talking. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a horny tea talking. Um, he brought so, us horny tea, by the way. Yeah, just so none, of us, none of us took it. <laughs> we don't need it. Yeah, I'm wearing sweats. So, your, sorry, your question again. So, is, vibration. Why doesn't the why doesn't the lymphatic system like vibration? Well, the body doesn't like vibration. Okay. It, sees, it sees it as. An so, attack. what's your theory? What do you what do you think about all the power plates and every the, the, the that big greatest crave that's been going for? So, us? you take somebody who's very very aligned. You put them on a power plate and have them walk for ten or fifteen minutes afterwards, and all of a sudden their necks going to be out, shoulders belt. Mm-hmm. It happens hundred percent of the time. It's it's what happens is is that it's kind of like if you have like room temperature water and if you're if it's ten below zero it feels warm and if it's uh, if it's ninety degrees it feels cold. Um, so the the idea is the body the body's always self regulating and when things if your vibration is it just feels like it's an attack like when you were rubbing the fascia on your stomach mm-hmm. if you go too fast it actually tightens up mm. and we go slower and then it loosens up. And that was what I was trying to show you while we had you on the table there. Mm-hmm. And so that the body doesn't like, it, it, it's trying to perceive what's happening and shaking isn't something that's, that's normal to it, right? Mm. So it says it must be, there must be something to have a fight to, to fear. So as soon as it starts shaking, you watch, get on a power plate, you start clenching your jaw afterwards. Mm. <laughs> You'll notice it. Really? So what do you, what do and you... The, by the way, the jaw, the reason why we did the jaw, remember the primary stress indicator for the body is a jaw. Yeah. If the jaw is, if the jaw is tight, the brain thinks you're clenching it. And there's a nerve called the fifth cranial nerve. It goes right up into the center of the brain. And it literally tugs on that nerve. And then your body fires adrenaline, noradrenaline, norepinephrine because your brain perceives you're clenching because of an outside stressor. So the idea is, is that's why when we released your jaw, that's why it's all that euphoric feeling and, and clear headedness and able to think and stuff like that. So what, mm. what would you say to the train? Cause I've seen trainers that absolutely love to use the power plate. <laughs> They'll have clients get on there because they see that I, that it, they can get into a deeper squat and range of motion. So they'll put them on the power plate and have them do these deep squats. Let's just align them so that they can get that deeper squat and range of motion anyways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, if we're using external stuff to do something that we should be able to do naturally, let's fix it. Well, this is how we've always felt anyway, just like being able to connect intrinsically to that, you know, and be right. able to produce that uh, a sort of support system on your own versus like having that external like feedback. That yeah. You're I, I relying used, upon. I used one, uh, I don't know, about a year ago or maybe when we were over at Club Sport and I, I, I would get on it and do these positions and test it out and it just felt like it was tricking my body. Mm-hmm. Like it felt like it's tricking my body so now I can get into ranges of motion that I normally don't have control over, so which is why my body doesn't let me get in those ranges of motion. Right, exactly, because it's it's about your, your range of motion. It's also about uh, the neurological inputs, your motor control. Like what we test people all the time is like they'll come in and uh, they'll have they'll have structurally everything is okay, but they'll have pain like moving their neck in one direction, and it's usually a motor control issue, and we need to uh, you know ferret that out and solve it. And so so the it's the job the job of the brain once again just like I put the smell in your in your one nostril mm-hmm. it changed your gait. Mm-hmm. If a single odor can do that, then what do you think other things that impact us daily are doing to our our human existence, right? right. 
Mm. Yeah, we're not, we're just not meant to have all this stuff around. And I'm not on the other side saying, I'm not putting my phone into a Faraday cage, into a microwave. I'm like not. Do, like Dr. Mercola. <laughs> yeah, he actually, yeah. we actually interviewed him and he actually sleeps Selfie in, stick. Like, looks like a Faraday cage. People. Okay, yeah. sorry, Dr. Mercola. Um, thank you for answering the message that I sent to you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, he was asking about our keto product, how we activated it without MCT oil. Oh, oh, cool! And uh, did you so, send it over to him? He'd probably be a great guy to send that over to. Well, him. he 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 uh, sent me an email right afterwards asking how we did it through Ben, and then so I got the chance to talk to him back. He's uh, so sorry if you sleep in a Faraday cage, but I'm not saying I'm saying I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and I just we have to adapt to the world that we live in, and so we have to be practical and reasonable in some aspect. But we but that means that I take every opportunity to do the things that are right for me, so that the things that I can't affect or avoid, like. Like the chances of me not sitting again are pretty slim to none. I mean, I'm sitting right now. Right. But so I, I actually, I've built a compensatory routine to help my body endogenously adapt to the environment that it's in. So there are stressors in my life that are not going to change uh, because where I live and what I do, I go, I get on airplanes. Airplanes aren't good for the well, body. Well, Dr. Annie Galpin would, would argue that there's some actually good health and <clears throat> positive benefits to actually keeping these things that it's putting our body in these stressful states uh, intermittently in our life. That's okay. Yeah, no, I'm not, we need, we need contrast. Right. The body needs, if it, if it, everything was always the same, the body would just like anything else, you don't use a limb, eventually it atrophies. Right. Our compensatory action in our brain as a reticular activating system in, in particular needs to have that activity, but it doesn't need to have it at the extreme level. If I sit 12 hours a day, I'm going to have a problem if I don't do something about it. If I take massive amounts of vitamin C or creatine, I'm going to have a reaction. If I drink uh, 12 hours a day alcohol, I'm going to have a problem. So the idea is to live in the best way we can. And we start off with a really simple process of alignment. Um, we have found, we've got over 100, and everything that I'm going to talk about is, is provable by some form of science. So we have over 100 lab tests that show our baseline stress, sympathetic response. We need a sympathetic response to live. Otherwise, you got to walk around. You can't always be parasympathetic. Yeah. Correct, right. And a car honks its horn, you're supposed to shock and then go back into parasympathetic. But the sympathetic response is, is being um, uh, because of my, we found that malfunctioning biomechanics response for, uh, respond for, or sorry, account for 75% of the sympathetic response. So when we take away the malfunctioning biomechanics, call your sympathetic response is your stress cup. If your stress cup's 100% full, any outside stressor makes you feel overwhelmed. So the more you can bring down your baseline stress by reducing uh, habituating activities is one way of doing it. That's why we like habits. Another way to do it is to make sure our mechanics are, are functioning properly. Because when you walk and your, and your arch isn't working on your foot and you have to engage other muscles, your brain starts thinking about it, has to do all this math. And the way it gets you to deal with it is it fires stress hormones in order to compensate for it. Mm. And so when our mechanics are functioning well, then our baseline stress drops. And then we are able to have... Uh, all these other things in our lives without them being overwhelming or harming us in, in a way that's deleterious. What do you find is cause, causes stress uh, in your own personal life? What is something that you have to be a, aware of or combat or put into practice like meditation or things? So I used to meditate. I used to stretch. Mm -hmm. um, my work is my meditation now. Like when you're working with people at the, at the level we do, we're 100% present while we're now, doing it. Well, okay, so I'm going to stop you there. because So my, uh, my Katrina, the girl I've been with for six and a half years, uh, is they've been uh, they ran the first massage clinic in the Bay Area, then they actually taught the first school. So most anybody that's been in this area in the last 20, 30 years and been certified probably sure. went through their clinic. Uh, so a lot of the practices that you took me through are actually familiar somewhat to me, although I hadn't gone through them personally. Sure. Uh, her mom talks about them and stuff. And there's a reason why I was asking you that. Oh, so one of the things that she they talk about uh, is being around a lot of this uh, you know, sick and bad energy and picking it up yourself. You say your work is kind of your de-stressor. I thing. used to, I, so universal principle, everything that I, I pushed your hand, you yeah, resisted. Right. Everything I pushed against, I get more of. Right. I used to try and get everybody's energy off me, protect myself. And I would go home at the end of every day, beat up. Right. Exhausted. So I found a new way and I just had to, I'm a kind of a, kind of a science geek. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think of Star Trek as my, you know, my favorite. So I think of the energy, the negative energy being a black hole. Mm -hmm. And I've got my engines and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm pointing away from the black hole and I'm spinning around. That's what, I, that's what my life was like before. When we go right into that person's energy, guess what happens? Mm -hmm. It no longer affects us. 
just because everybody's been doing it for one way for tens of years, t- thousands of years, doesn't mean it's right. And and what's happened is is that the health of, of our staff has steadily inclined because they're doing the same thing now. Mm. So instead of fighting it, we're going into it. Yeah, you can't. It's 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 funny because people try to fight stress. You can't fight stress. Fighting is stress. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing when people seek yeah, happiness. When you, when you, Seekiness is not. But when you talk about <laughs> what he's talking about, where they have trained themselves to be able to feel the pain they're going through and feel that energy and almost absorb it yourself. Not, not absorb it, feel it. Okay, so. so there's a difference. If I was to give you an example, I see two pipes coming off of each person in my imagination. Okay. One pipe has the information I need to help them. The other pipe is all the deleterious, unnecessary crap that's got to go. And it okay. just goes through me like I'm a conduit. And and that's the way that I was able to, listen, I, for three and a half years, I've worked 12 to 14 to 16 hours a day on a table. Mm-hmm. And anybody who does body work, you just ask them how that's, long. That's crazy. Yeah, and but everybody here will tell you that I've been doing that. And and I'm the healthiest I've ever been in my life. Like I, I, I sleep well now for the first time in my life. I don't have racing thoughts throughout the day. Do you, um, do you feel all the people that work for you have the same ability or is this something that you've learned to really hone in? And because We teach I, it. We teach it. So everybody here can do it. And we can even demonstrate as we will later on. We'll show you exactly how. Like, uh, uh, I know it sounds woo-woo, but uh, we could we could sit you up. We could go through your spine, vertebra by vertebra by, by vertebrae, and uh, we could accurately tell you which ones are out. I can have Dr. Luke, who's here as a chiropractor, verify that at the end without ever touching you. And so I know that sounds a little hard to believe until you see it or you experience it, but that's it. Just we just started noticing we at the volume of people we have. And the fact that we see them for like we see our clients for two hours at a, a, every session, <clears throat> and and that's a lot. And mm-hmm. we're interacting with them. They're walking. We're talking. We're learning about them. And that's part of what's what's been lost in the field of healthcare and medicine is the fact that getting to know the people that you're actually working oh, with. Oh yeah. It's no, what is the average? Twelve 50, minutes. Fifty or? minutes. Yeah. Yes. Twelve minutes. <laughs> so, but the, what's cool about that? What's co- what's really 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 neat about it is is when you um um. When you start seeing people at this volume and you have, and you're seeing chiropractically, you're seeing fascial flow, which is massage, neurological rehabilitation, diet, nutrition, testing, our alignment work, you start to see things that you don't see in other forms of, of therapy or medicine because they're all there. You see somebody's emotional response to something that they did while they're physically working, or you see that it's, it's funny because um, people come in, let's just say that when they're in pain, they're a little ornery sometimes. Fair statement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the staff are trained is like when somebody comes in and, and there's this one guy in particular, uh, and he just was a he was just ornery, like a real dick to to our, to our especially to our front end staff. And I pull up his lab work and I said, "This is why." And watch what happens. And over the course of the sixty days, he's like the most happy, joyful. He just his body was in a bad bad spot. Right. We see that as trainers. Yeah. We've seen that so many times as trainers. Yeah, yeah. Same thing. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Same thing. So Dude, I'm I'm excited to watch Justin get your uh, fingers <laughs> in his mouth there. So I'm, I'm, he's nominated let's, me. Let's do this. Let's get this party started. Yeah, his, Sal should combo his, less, his left yeah. glute is uh, out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's out. Needs adjustment. Yeah. Um, so uh, you looking, tried massaging it. Really looking ahead, uh, what are you guys trying? What do you want to do in the future? Are you trying to get more locations or trying to? So good question. Um, so here's how we're handling the growth right now. Um, we have people from all over the world come here. We've got a waiting list with a couple thousand people that, get that, that are on it right now. We're moving them through as fast as we can. We, For people who can't get here, we actually can do remote assessments. We do it over Skype. We watch gait analysis. We give them corrective exercises and routines, and we can do our lab work remotely. Um, we also have a – we've just – we've been training up all these new staff, 15 of them. Uh, they're all – I was away on vacation. Everybody certified on the floor now? Just about – just about. So we got them all. We put them through a very long and extensive uh, training program. And uh, so we were starting up with the travel team. We got about 600 clients from New York. We've got about, uh, we do a lot of celebrities. Like we do all the DC comic heroes as an example. Mm. So they're up in Vancouver shooting. So we have a travel team that's going to start traveling to New York, popping up twice a month. And then in cool. Vancouver once a month. And what we're, our whole thing is, this is really not about um, opening up a million locations. We'll open locations. Like uh, we're, we're negotiating in London right now and uh, we're, uh, we're going to handle the New York thing because people can still travel fairly easily to us uh, through the remote travel because for us it's space and building a location takes time as you guys sure. know. Well, and I feel like you guys really are about the science and data. That's right. So mm-hmm. this is really an intellectual property play. Right. What we're going to be doing is our, 
our therapies fit in every form of medicine somewhere. Uh, like the jaw work, you know, like uh, we have n- dozens of dentists that we work with who will now send people in for jaw for jaw work after they've been under the chair and they've been pulling stuff around because they're realizing the effects that the jaw has mm. on the gait. Interesting. So you go to a dentist, you sit there for two hours, with your mouth open, you get up and you walk away and no one's, no one's. Wow. Con- he fixes your cavity, but then fucks <laughs> up your gait. <laughs> That's exactly right. No. And, and you saw that, yeah, Adam, you saw yeah. that yourself, how much, how much that impact. Listen, we have 350, look at the overall of the body. We have 350 muscles from the neck up, 340 approximately from the neck down. There's more muscles from here up than there is down, and they all balance each other 100%, as you saw when we did your jaw. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is we have 206 bones in the body, 106 in the feet and the hands. And the bones provide a lot of information to the brain on what to do. And we showed you uh, the five floating bones in your body, how they affected the way you stood and walked mm-hmm. and how, how, to, how we would manipulate them. So the idea is to take these bits of information and adapt it to a different form. So we have, we have dozens of doctors who are clients. And now we have, um, we've got about, I don't know, 15 or 20 that are hitting us up for internships right now where we have MDs and DCs and uh um, orthopedics um, that are coming in and they're they're looking at internships so we can help they can help us adapt what we do to their their mm. particular field and then what we'll do is we'll set up licensed training programs to train different individuals in each one of those medical fields so that's really our long-term strategy Sorry. well that's nice. awesome how can people contact you well you can go to our website we have a waiting list um, i apologize we're trying to get through it um but in a, in advance of that uh, you can sign up and it'll be more specific where you can ask for remote consultations and stuff like that, which we can handle a lot faster because mm-hmm. we're, as you know, we're limited by space. Sure. We're in Venice, Google, Snapchat, everybody else. I mean, there's no, there's no space left there. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that's one, that's one way that they can get hold of us. If they're, uh, if they're with one of our, our, uh, our partner doctors and they get a referral, they get a, they'll get brought up through the list a lot faster. But we're starting to run into problems with that now too because we've got so many doctors that are referring or either clients and referring to us. But that's the best place is to is just to come online, follow us on social media. And your, your website, humangarage.net? Dot, dot net, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, thanks for coming on, brother. Yeah. yeah. It was a great time, guys. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Now we're going to go put fingers and mouths. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's Can't wait. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.